Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Well, yesterday was eventful, wasn't it? Yeah, I'll say. Handful of interesting things on both a roto or a head to head side. Coming out of a big Wednesday, and we pirouette. That's the move we're doing here between days. We pirouette into a five-game Thursday that I'm sure everybody's been preparing for. Long streams. We talked about Thursdays. We talked about this particular Thursday an awful lot. So, hope you guys are ready to roll. Welcome to the show. It's Fantasy NBA Today. A sports ethos presentation. I have to pause before I do it because I'm so prone to calling it hoop ball. I'm Dan Baspers. Thanks again for tuning in, everybody. Uh, I'm guessing that most of you that are listening right now are folks that are in Roto Leagues or the handful of head-to-head leaguers that uh, things are still kind of punching along here at the end. We're, we're hanging tough, man. We're doing it. We're going to get there. Lots of streams, lots of moves to be made. Let's just dive right on in. Oh, by the way, follow me on Twitter, at Dan Vespers. Anybody that's new that is finding this show now for the first time thinking, ah, why isn't there a show that's telling me how to stream in the playoffs almost exclusively this time of year? Well, you found it. Uh, And we're going to do that for one more week. We're going to be focused very hard on playoff streaming for one more week. Next week and then the last week of the regular season, we'll kind of pivot back into silly season roto stream type of guys, getting you to the finish line. And right after the regular season ends, we pivot into lessons learned. We do not have a break. We'll also talk a little bit more sports betting as we get into the playoff stuff. That's just kind of fun to do during the playoffs. And and that's the plan going forward. Again, no offseason here on Fantasy NBA Today. Welcome to all the new listeners. I know at least a handful of you have found it through Twitter. Uh, thank you to everybody that's gone over and followed me over there. Again, I'm trying to hit this equilibrium point, And together we can get there. Let's look at yesterday, though. Big big day. We're going to try to kind of crash through the games where not a ton happened. Detroit-Atlanta, blowout win for the Pistons. Uh, say it out loud. It same, sounds just as crazy as when I was reading it on the paper. Um, Not a whole lot. I mean, Danilo Gallinari's not playing in back-to-backs, which basically makes him not a head-to-head streamable player because he just can't, like, the times you'd want to use him He wouldn't be playing in all of the games. DeAndre Hunter is a solid stream because he will play in the back-to-backs, and we still don't really have an update on John Collins, just kind of out right now. Uh, As far as Atlanta's schedule goes, they got a game tomorrow, and then they're off until Monday. So head-to-head-wise, no one's really all that great, although they do have a four-game week next week with back-to-back on Wednesday, Thursday. React accordingly, and if you want to squeeze kind of a one-day hunter roto stream in there it would be one of those two back-to-backs one thing that i think we can say about the hawks pretty definitively is that they're moving away from clint capella it's not going to be entirely this year but they're going to be trying to move him because they want to get on An- Aniko kongu in there he's their center of the future he actually make a lot of sense as a as a keeper dynasty type the writing's on the wall and the minutes per game are basically that writing on the wall as far as Detroit goes, they're going into rest mode here. Uh, sounds like Jeremy Grant is going to rest in the next ball game. This is exactly what we saw last year out of the Pistons, where uh, Grant just started taking you know one out of every two and then two out of every three games off, and we just kind of had to deal with it. But it does sound like he's already been ruled out for the next one, we think. That's all the indications. If he just sort of plays every other game the rest of the way, that's good news uh, for Marvin Bagley, who's not really a particularly strong roto play, but if he, he, you know, he may or may not get the start if Grant sits. It could be Kelly Olynyk, it could be someone else. They just slide everybody up a click. But either way, we know he's going to get close to thirty minutes, and I think I'd probably stream him in just about every, just about every format in thirty minutes, especially now knowing that that Grant is kind of in and out of the lineup. Plus, there's a back-to-back next week, and you know a bunch of Pistons are getting rested in at least one of those two games as well. Other guy to keep an eye on is Killian Hayes. He played 33 minutes off the bench, 13-8-5. Uh, Doesn't really shoot the three ball. Turnovers, free throw percentage, not all that great. So, again, from a Roto standpoint, it's a little bit of a tougher sell, but 30-plus minutes as guys start getting shut down, he's going to be told, hey, you get to go do some stuff. 
and I'd keep an eye on him too. But I'm not going to do it until Corey Joseph is officially kind of getting the plug pulled on his season, which is such a crass expression, but we use it in sports. We use it for a lot of things that are not actual health stuff. Uh, we know Corey Joseph is going to rest at least one game next week. I got to think it's going to be more. Is there really any reason to play him at all in most of these games? Again, Roto, it's tougher. Head-to-head, it's actually not bad because a four-game week is happening right now. They got a four-game week next week, and then hopefully your head-to-head stuff is done. Knicks beat the Hornets 121-106. Knicks are basically out of the playoffs at this point. They're starting to rest some guys as well. Julius Randle is out. Again, Obi Toppin had a really nice ball game, 18-11-6. and six. We don't have a great indicator of how long Randall's going to be out. We'll probably be getting him as kind of a game-time deal most days going forward. He got ruled out uh, about four or five hours, eh, four, three, four hours before tip for yesterday's game. Imagining that'll kind of be the thing going forward for him. Knicks are in the middle of a five-game and seven-night stretch, so... uh, I don't think I can pick up Toppin on a head-to-head side when you know Randall comes back and he just disappears. Roto, you could add him, and then if you find out Randall's not playing, you drop OB into your lineup. That's an easier thing to do without that moves limit. Kind of the same story for Taj Gibson. I know he didn't start. Jericho Sims did. And Sims played about as well as he could, and he still only got 25 minutes. If he was bad for any stretch of time, you would have seen Taj for an extra two or three minutes, and Gibson in 25, 26 minutes would be around at top 100 center just because you're going to have decent percentages he'll usually kind of bungle his way into a block five or six rebounds that kind of deal again not a head-to-head decision here and Mitchell Robinson might very well be back in the next ball game Roto the door is open you know if you look for it every day has a cause for celebration celebrate a friend got a promotion had a baby got married life who cares Celebrate yourself for keeping the couch warm. It's no easy feat, especially if that's a big couch. Or maybe you just want to celebrate living in 2022, where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered from Drizzly in under 60 minutes, one hour, without leaving the aforementioned couch. Right now, Drizzly is giving all new customers five bucks off their first order with code FAST5. Yeah, it's like the movie franchise. Fast Five. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com, D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com, and use promo code Fast Five for $5 off your first order. Look, it's the most convenient way to get beer, wine, and spirits. 60 minutes! 60 minutes! That's ridiculously fast. I can't do anything in under 60 minutes these days. It's the number one app for alcohol delivery. It's so convenient. You can shop across different stores. You can choose from a huge selection and get the prices you want, get the best deals, and turn your casual night at home into a much more relaxing casual night at home. I don't know, man. The weather sucks or nobody wants to go out these days. It's been a weird couple of years. You're cooking. Whatever it is, this is the solution. Drizzly.com. Or the Drizzly app, D-R-I-Z-L-Y. Again, use promo code FAST5, get $5 off your first order, and get beer, wine, and spirits to your doorstep in under 60 minutes. Dish Network knows the importance of having a reliable television provider. That's why Dish puts reliability first, with 99% signal reliability anywhere in the country, including rural America. So you can watch your teams, news, and favorite shows without being interrupted, no matter where you live. Get 99% signal reliability with DISH. Call 1-844-CALL-DISH, visit dish.com, or find a retailer near you to sign up today. 99% reliability based on data from set-top boxes. Better stream on the Roto side is Davian Mitchell. We've been hearing repeatedly that De'Aaron Fox may or may not be back this season, which means he's going to miss at least a couple more games. And Mitchell, as the starting point guard and sort of grand pooba of this team right now, he's ready to go nuts. Two huge games in a row. I see no reason why that wouldn't continue going forward as long as Fox is out. Mitchell should be added, streamed, whatever you want to call it, in all formats. The other stuff with the Kings is a little bit cockeyed. Because Justin Holiday started, but Dante DiVincenzo played 31 inefficient minutes off the bench. He's someone to keep an eye on, but those percentages are not good. 
Still, if he gets bumped into the starting lineup, you almost have to do something with it. Harrison Barnes has been damn near close to a drop lately. You, you know, the season's over. He's a veteran on the team, so he's starting to dial back the energy on a game-to-game basis. Kings are in a very bad scheduling week, which I still think you probably could have dropped Barnes after yesterday. So you could do it today. They do have four games next week. They play every other day, so rest days may or may not be a factor. So uh, to that end, I think if you're in a tough battle right now, you drop Barnes today. He just hasn't been good enough lately. I think he's been near the top 200. And we know he can be a top 75, top 80 guy when he's sort of full tilt, but he's not right now. Again, the writing's on the wall. Season's over. It's time to pack it in. Guys are shutting it down. Rashawn Holmes shut it down for personal reasons. Sabonis has the knee. Fox has the I don't even remember what. Okay. Trey Lyles was a popular stream. Yours truly, I did it too. And he only got 22 minutes. He's still going to be good. If you're the starting power forward on this Kings team, you're in a decent spot. Does he get some rest days? It's possible. Lyles is a veteran, but this is also an opportunity for him to kind of show his wares a little bit, try to end up on a maybe a contender next year, something, who knows, become a trade chip. I didn't look up his contract status. I'm sorry. It's, I wasn't expecting to go too much into detail on next year for Trey Lyles. But as we're sort of gaming out whether or not he's going to play going forward, I think he will. As we just mentioned, the Kings don't have a back-to-back until the last two days of the regular season. So, and I get it, Lyles wasn't very good. And Shemezi Metu was excellent in this ball game. So if he wasn't as good, then you would have seen more Lyles. Damian Jones got the start for Sabonis, and he's fine. His fantasy game actually isn't that good. He doesn't block many shots. He's mostly a field goal percent guy. Sometimes rebounds. That's not actually... Like, if he's going to get 30 minutes every night, you probably do it. But I need to know that that's guaranteed before I make that move. Again, especially on a team with kind of a clunky schedule. But he could end up as a bit of a specialist for your club next week, week after. Particularly next week. Go four games, drop someone in there. Maybe he... Maybe you had a team that is not great at field goal percent. He could actually single-handedly dramatically improve that for your team. He's not going to take a ton of shots, but in a four-game week, he really could go like 16 for 24. It's pretty reasonable. 17 for 24, 18 for 24 if you get a little bit lucky. That's a big bump on a one-week field goal percent. And it'll help a little bit in Roto as well. He needs to catch up some games at the center position. So keep an eye on that. We'll know more about the Kings as we roll up on their next one. That's on Saturday. We can talk about them on tomorrow's kind of long, streamy show. But I do think a lot of these guys make more sense from a Roto standpoint because the Kings don't have two games the rest of this week, and I don't want you guys using moves on Monday of next week unless you absolutely have to. So Davian Mitchell, fire it up. That's an easy one. I mean, honestly, even in head-to-head with a two-game week, he probably does enough at this particular clip, oddly enough. And then the rest of these guys, Jones, Lyles, Barnes, DiVincenzo, these are all guys we keep an eye on. And for Roto, if you want to grab them for one game on Saturday, you know, we'll talk about it tomorrow. But I think if you're kind of ranking them, you probably have Lyles at the top as the most trustworthy among the non-Davion Mitchell guys. Those Lyles then Barnes, then Jones, and then probably DiVincenzo, just because we kind of know enough about his fantasy game to know it doesn't translate that great unless he gets to do a ton. Meanwhile, over on the Indiana side, Isaiah Jackson tried to play, ended up with a headache, so you do wonder how the hell he passed concussion protocol. I would call into question what Indiana's doing out there. Shouldn't have passed it, be my guess. I mean, who, what other reason is there for a headache right after a concussion? You could blame it on seasonal allergies, I guess, but that feels fishy at best so with no Jalen Smith in this one Goga Batadze got to play 30 minutes and you guys know I don't like Goga very much but 30 minutes you gotta have to O'Shea Brissett played 33 minutes really not a good nine cat guy every once in a while he'll pop off for a big ball game and I mean 10 to 10 with a couple of threes is fine but I can't recommend him in nine cat they are in the middle of a back-to-back right now, so this is sort of the time if you wanted to, to roll with them and head-to-head. Four-game week next week, every other day starting on Monday. Uh, I think Goga's probably your guy in more of a roto sense because as dudes come back, that gives you the opportunity to drop him quickly if you need to. I'm not touching Brissett and everything else I pretty much leave alone. 
I'm holding on to Jackson and Smith, by the way. If I can in Roto head-to-head, you probably have to move on because you can't take zeros. Much as you'd like to keep them, I don't think you can. Interesting note here as Memphis beat Brooklyn. Uh, Nets had the two best fantasy lines in the NBA last night and lost the game because the Grizzlies, even without John Morant, are just really good. They just come at you in waves, and you saw the, the... I mean, they got 101 shots, the Nets 87. It's a lot of that is rebounding. A lot of that's rebounding. Now, of course, the big news from yesterday, kind of buried that here in this recap, Kyrie Irving expected to be cleared for home games as soon as Sunday. So he's got another road game coming up, I think, tomorrow without checking. They do have two games left this week. Huge win if you were somehow squatting on Kyrie this whole time and just praying that he got cut loose. Personally, I'm actually really excited. I have Kyrie Irving in a keeper league, and I got him in the fifth round last year, so uh, I could keep him in the third, and if he's now cleared to play in every game next season, getting that dude in the third round, oh boy. I mean, here's the thing. I know he hasn't played many games, so from an energy standpoint, he's about as high as it gets, but in the games he has played this year, he's number two in nine cat. Yeah, I know. By totals, it's not close, of course. But number two, we're talking about a top first-round guy. No one's catching Nikola Jokic on a per-game basis or by totals. It's the same thing again. Uh, But, yeah, I feel pretty excited about that. Andre Drummond came back, so Nick Claxton's stream is over. On the Memphis side, John Morant. Sounds like he's actually pretty dinged up here, talking to our Grizzlies coverage team of David and Isaac at Ethos Grizzlies, if you'd like to follow them over there, uh, mentioning that the feeling they got from kind of reading the body language and, and the tea leaves is that Morant's going to be out here for a little bit, and the Grizzlies are going to try to get him ready for the playoffs, of course, uh, but they're not going to rush him back. So Tyus Jones, DeAnthony Melton are both very good ads right now, and we just got word before I went on air here that the Grizzlies are basically resting everybody on the second half of this back-to-back. They've got Indiana, so they feel like they can pretty much walk through it. So Dylan Brooks is out on the second half of the back-to-back. Brandon Clark has been nursing some stuff. He's out on the second night of the back-to-back. Uh, I feel like there was one more I'm missing, although it wasn't someone expected to be in your lineup. Obviously, Ja, because he's dinged up. Was it Was it Killian Tilly? Is that not even the, the right team? I don't even know if that's the right team. <laughs> What team is this dude on? It doesn't matter. Um, so what that means for us on the fantasy standpoint is that tonight, Desmond Bain, DeAnthony Melton, Tyus Jones, these guys are going to go huge. JJJ is going to have to do a lot. Who gets slotted in for the Brooks and Clark minutes? I'm not positive Zaire Williams will get to play more. It does feel like here, as the kind of the veterans get to do a bit more at the end of the year, that slow mo probably makes sense as a one day, a one off kind of thing. Uh, and then you punt him back into the moon for the next one. Boston smoked Utah, got off to this very quick start, and then just never relented. Damn, I love Time Lord's fantasy lines 12 and 10, two steals, four blocks, six out of seven shooting, two assists to boot. Celtics are defensively pretty unbelievable and they're 46 and 28 now i think they were my biggest over season win total bet and then when they when they started the year like what was it like 20 and 20 i'm looking around like oh crap and then all of a sudden they just started ripping off wins at a ridiculous clip they are effectively tied with the sixers and bucks so they played two more games than those teams and they're all a game and a half back of the heat. So there's a lot of jockeying going on at the top of the East. You guys know I have a 25-1 to ticket for the Celtics to win the Atlantic when they were five games back near the end of January. Come on, baby. Bring it on home. Nothing to take away fantasy-wise from this game. It was a blowout early. What's going on with the Heat right now? They've lost focus. Miami's lost two in a row. Very winnable games. Warriors without Steph. Before that, Sixers without Harden and Embiid. I'm sure they're going to be fine. But Miami, it just, it just feels like they've lost an edge a little bit. Maybe Tyler Hero being gone plays a part, not having that bench punch. But just defensively, letting a Stephalus Warrior team shoot 52%, unacceptable. Uh, this was the everybody rests game for Golden State. So uh, you got to see more 
Jordan Poole, more Damian Lee, more Andrew Wiggins. Kevon Looney, you knew he'd get to play more against Bam. He had 16 rebounds in this game. And uh, Gary Payton was the guy. I was kind of curious what his role might be when everybody was resting, and he was fine, but unspectacular. I think as you move towards the Warriors in the you know the games where Otto gets to play, he's a great Roto start. Clay Thompson will be back in there. Dre will be back in there. Those guys returning will polish off Damian Lee and Gary Payton, and probably to some degree Jonathan Kaminga. Now, in head-to-head, if you picked up any of these guys, you just kind of got to ride them through at this point because the Warriors still, after a day off today, they have three and four nights. So you're not going to pivot off of that. That's basically a wasted move because uh, pretty much nobody plays more than three games in the next five nights, and that's what you'd be comparing it to if you made a move today. Phoenix beat Minnesota, big game for DeAndre Ayton, who, by the way, uh, I haven't looked up to see where the hell DeAndre Ayton is on the year, but once again, I think he's had a good second half. Yeah, he's up to number 37 now. It's pretty similar to last year, actually, where Ayton got off to a pretty damn slow start and then kind of coasted along at like a mid-third round clip the second half of the year, showed awesome durability for the second season in a row, and despite what you'd probably call a little bit of kind of a meh season um by totals no i guess he did miss like 10 games early in the year for something didn't he yeah that's right he missed a few so less durable this season i don't know he's been fine whatever um i don't know why we're talking about him he's not who i came in to talk about chris paul due back soon at that point campaign becomes a drop jay crowder's back so tory craig is a drop don't know if you necessarily have to start crowder although he was in some foul trouble here so i think in general, they'll probably try to target him more in that 27-28 minute range. And we've seen without Chris Paul, he's had to do more. But of course, Paul, close to coming back, I don't know that any of those power forwards for Phoenix need to be rostered once CP3 is back in the mix. No changes for me on the Minnesota side. Uh, Jared Vanderbilt did double-double. That's something, I guess. But I sort of don't care. Thunder got big games out of Theo Maladon and Isaiah Roby who's back in everybody's good graces again. Viet Krejci had 12 and 11, but I don't care. Poku started inefficient, but if he's starting, you got to go with him. 6, 8, and 4, 2 steals, 2 blocks. That's solid. Trey Mann had 21 points, but almost nothing else. Darius Baisley had a Baisley game of bad shooting, but he's generally been startable. Kind of forgive the slow ones here. I mean, this is, this is a pretty bad one, but at least he didn't turn the ball over. No Shea, and the Thunder won anyway. Orlando doing a much better job of uh, purposefully losing a basketball game here. Orlando's going to have guys in and out the rest of the way. You can't really make any broad statements on that team based on this one ball game. And they only play one game the rest of this week. They go four every other day next week. We don't know who the hell is going to be in and out for those games. So whatever you've got, just sort of stick with it at this point. On the Roto side, head-to-head... Like, meh, you could make an argument to drop almost anybody on that team if you're in a tight battle this week and you need three games the rest of the way instead of one. Almost anyone on the wire will smoke a one-game magic with three games because no one on this team is that good. Franz Wagner's been solid enough. Bamba's been fine. Wendell Carter Jr.'s been fine, but he's now hurt. Cole Anthony's been fine. No one's good enough in a one-game stretch the rest of this week. Roto, again, just, you know, whatever you got, just stick with it. Alpern Shango's starting to play a little bit more for Houston. That was something I mentioned, I think, on yesterday's show. It might have been the day before. He's up into the low 20s in minutes on basically a nightly basis now. Unfortunately, because he does still have some pretty gaping percentage-based holes in his fantasy game, the overall rank is not going to reflect the bump in minutes that clearly he's made most of his free throws the last five six days and so over that stretch he's just inside the top 100 if the free throw number comes down though that pushes him back kind of into that streaming zone still he's a great keeper we know this he's going to get better little by little you can see the outlines of it christian wood is not going to be in houston forever i think he's only signed for one more year without looking it up uh, but as far as the end of this season goes he did make sense as a nice streamer because houston had a five and seven that they're now 60% of the way through. And they go Portland, Portland, Friday, Saturday. So that should be fun. And next week, San Antonio, two games against Sacramento. So the next five games for Houston are against some of the highest scoring zero defense teams in the NBA. As much as I hate the Rockets, 
that does make a guy like Sengun an interesting stream. Uh, Eric Gordon, unfortunately, in and out of the lineup makes both Gordon and Garrison Matthews difficult to deploy. And told you from day one this year, do not roster Kevin Porter Jr. Sure enough, we've gone the entire year now, and he hasn't really gotten better. Uh, Jalen Green had a rare off night here. Dallas can play some pretty good defense, though. No Luka. They didn't need him. Dinwiddie and Brunson get to do a ton when Luka's out. That's an easy sell. Uh, Reggie Bullock. This is kind of what I thought would happen. He had that big game coming back, and, you know, the usage was just too low. The usage being that low for someone that takes three-pointers, you you need him to be able to reliably take, like, Marcus Morris levels at 11, 12 shots a game. Dwight Powell's been decent lately. He's more streamer level. Same deal with Dorian Finney-Smith. So you got to look for the right pocket. And for the Mavs, that pocket is probably Tuesday through Sunday of next week. We're getting ahead of ourselves. He'll, uh, here, Philly beat the Lakers. No LeBron. You can pretty much throw this box score out, so we'll just kind of coast on through. Anytime LeBron sits, uh, Monk is going to take enough shots to be fantasy relevant. Melo is going to be enough, take enough shots. Russ probably gets over the hump when LeBron's out, although his turnovers and his free throws were typically bad. Doesn't matter, though. LeBron's going to play. This was the Lakers taking a scheduled L here. Uh, <laughs> they only have two game lead over the Spurs for the last wild card spot. That's that's not great. Woof. Spurs beat the Blazers. The tanking Blazers. Spurs smoked them. Uh, Justice Winslow's a drop. Left calf tightness. They're, you know, they're, they're not going to push him through anything at this point. Same deal with Josh Hart. He's dealing with some soreness, but he's not going to play unless he's 100% healthy. Drew Eubanks' 10-day contract ran out. It sounds like they just re-signed him to another one, and he's been awesome lately. He's been a top 60 fantasy play over the last four or five games, so use him in all formats for as long as you like. With no Winslow, Trendon Watford also likely bumps back up into that use-in-all-formats department. Portland, we just talked about with Houston, they got the Rockets two games in a row, Friday, Saturday, a four-game week next week for the following week, should you need it. I think these guys are good to go the rest of the way, and plenty of games left to do it. Chris Dunn, we don't know what the deal is on his 10-day contract. I believe it just expired. I don't think he's been re-signed yet, but I'd be pretty surprised if he wasn't because he's been good and he's getting a bunch of playing time. Another 26 minutes, uh, 25 and a half in this one. Assists, steals specialist in particular. You guys know I love that fantasy game. I would roll him out there too, because Brandon Williams isn't very good. He's young, so that, maybe that's not fair, but I haven't been all that impressed yet. And plus, the Blazers are going to bring back guard next year. You've probably heard of him. He's okay. Hey guys, I got to pause in the middle of the show to please ask you guys again to drop a five star review on the podcast. It's uh, it's so damn important to me, and I know many of you are listening here kind of for the first couple of weeks because you found it through Twitter. I need your help. This is a plea I do towards the end of every season, and I've I've mentioned why. Basically, if we can stockpile positive reviews going into the off season, then next year around draft season for the NBA, fantasy draft season, uh, people that are trying to find a new fantasy podcast, it allows ours to be higher on the list. We sort of show up on the big board. So I need your help with this, particularly on iTunes, if that's the way you're listening to the show. You can do it on the podcast app on your mobile device, if you're on an Apple device. Search for Fantasy NBA Today. I know you're already listening to the show, so you have to pause it, go into the search button, type in Fantasy NBA Today, Click on the show logo, not an episode name, and scroll all the way down to the bottom. You can do a quick five-star. If you want to write something, that's fine. I'm not going to ask you to take more than 20 seconds on this thing. If you're on a computer, open up iTunes. There's a little drop-down menu over kind of on the upper right. Select podcasts, and then you'll have to search again on the internet for Fantasy NBA Today. But on the computer, it's pretty easy. There's just a rate and review tab in the middle you can click over to. So thank you in advance to everybody that's been doing that. We're up over 780 now. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get to 800 before this season ends, but that would be a pretty awesome goal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, please, please. I did that in the wrong order, but I really do need your help with this. Let's try to get a few more in the hopper. And if you've already done it, grab somebody's phone standing next to you and do it on theirs. Streaming time and a big day for it, too, because I've been talking it up all week long. Thursday is your day to make decisions on what categories you're hunting for this week. 
because there are two teams, three actually, uh, maybe more, I'm losing track here. Uh, actually, yeah, it's quite a bit more. Apologies. So uh, Atlanta, Boston, the Lakers, the Clippers, although the Clippers have been so terrible, the Thunder, from a schedule standpoint, the Thunder, the Magic, the Kings, the Spurs, all of those teams have but one game the rest of this week starting today. There are very few players on those teams where, I mean, look, if you're fantasy, if you're in the finals right now, you basically drop anyone on those teams, even like second rounders. Because think of it this way. If you have like uh, the Time Lord, who you guys know I love with all of my heart, but if your season ends after Sunday, he has one game the rest of this week. They play Minnesota on Sunday. He's going to have Cat, and that'll be a pretty tough matchup, but I'm sure he'll do fine. But even a, a big Time Lord game, and yesterday was a pretty big one, a double-double with six defensive stats. Can you get that from someone else in three games? The answer is probably. Now, I'm not saying you start with that. In all likelihood, you have guys that are ranked lower that only have one game left the rest of this week that you could drop more easily. I'm not saying go drop the Time Lord. I'm just saying, if you think about it from a straight math standpoint, New Orleans and Washington each have three games left the rest of this week. It would be very hard to pick someone up on those teams who has sort of streamer level value that doesn't outperform even the best of the best in the NBA that only has one game left the rest of this week. And by all in all likelihood, they'll outperform them by a pretty good chunk. Season averages or last month averages are probably just as a reasonable way to do this math. Over the last month, if you look at guys that are ranked inside the top 30, like who on these teams on those clubs has only one game left this week? <laughs> All right, we'll go, we'll go big here. Uh, Trey Young only has one game left this week. Over the last month, he's been averaging 29 points, three threes, 10 assists, and a steal. First of all, you pick up almost anybody out there that's a streamer, you're going to beat him in steals by probably one, maybe be, maybe two, or even three. Can you find someone averaging 3.3 assists per game to match Trey Young in that department? Probably. It'll be close. There aren't that many guys averaging three assists, but you know maybe Alonetto's out there, maybe Ish Smith, maybe Devontae Graham, maybe Jose Alvarado. Can someone hit one three-pointer a game each of the next three days? Absolutely. Can someone average between 9 and 10 points the next three days? Absolutely. And this is one of the toughest examples I could have found. But basically, what I'm telling you is that you could probably make... And, you know, obviously he'll have a, probably a higher impact on your free throw percent, but whatever. We'll, we'll try to ignore that for just a minute. There is... There are, I would think, four options out there that would tie or probably beat Trey Young the rest of the way simply because they have three games and he has one. Now, forget that for a minute. Let's go a little farther down the board and say, okay, what about other guys on Atlanta? What about, like, Clint Capella, uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich, DeAndre Hunter, Kevin Herter, Anyago Kongwu? All of those guys, that's an easy call. Boston, Jason Tatum, tough call. Time Lord, tough call. Marcus Smart, droppable. If you're, this, again, is if your season ends on Sunday. If your season continues into next week, you put, the, you put the cutoff a much higher mark because Atlanta has four games next week. Boston has four games next week. Clippers, Lakers, four games next week. Most of these teams that have terrible schedules right now actually transition into better schedules next week. In fact, I believe every team that only has one game between now and Sunday has a four-game week next week. So you're not dropping these key players if your season continues. If it ends this week, just do the math. Hey, can I get more in three games from a Pell or a Wiz than whatever guy I'm dropping? If your season continues, you have to make sure that the guy you're streaming is farther down the board. So for me, I look at someone like Trey Lyles on Sacramento that looks really good, quite promising, 
and maybe you had him for the one game he had so far this week. Or if uh, Boston's probably not a great example. Atlanta's probably a better example. You might have had some Hawks for their back-to-back that just came to a conclusion, like DeAndre Hunter or Kevin Herter or Clint Capella or whatever. I mean, Capella, you might want to try to hang on to for the four-game week, but to get through this week, it wouldn't hurt you that much down the line to drop those guys for someone playing three games. What I'm saying basically is, at this point, pretty much anyone that's not inside the top 80 that only has one game the rest of this week is streamable. If we've been long streaming together, which I'm guessing we have if you're still listening to this podcast now, you probably have someone who's actually at streamer level that you can drop that only has one game left this week. Someone, like we just said with Atlanta, Kevin Herter falls into that category. DeAndre Hunter, Gallo, if you picked him up and then got screwed on the back-to-back, good examples on Atlanta. Boston, there aren't, really. And Clippers, you didn't have anybody. Maybe you had someone on the Lakers. Monk, Mello, whatever, those types of guys. Monk's been better than a streamer, but when LeBron's been back, he's actually kind of been pushed outside of it. Those guys are droppable. Those are easy decisions. And of course, if you have almost anyone on the Kings... Uh, or the Spurs, and you need to make it through this week, those guys are fairly droppable as well. The Spurs, you probably hang on to DeJounte Murray, Jakob Pertl, that might be it. Kings, I don't know that you need to hang on to anyone. You could make a case for Davion Mitchell, but we don't know if De'Aaron Fox might just magically pop up. So I think almost everybody on those teams, other than Murray and Pertl probably, including Keldon Johnson, including Devin Vassell, one game the rest of this week, You can probably beat it somewhere else. Same story with Orlando. Same story with Oklahoma City. So today's the day. I don't know if you have a four-game, a three-game moves limit, four-game move limit, five, whatever it might be. You can probably use up, I would say, all but one of your moves today because this is a rare day where you can get two extra games per move on a bunch of different guys. How many teams have I been saying only have one game the rest of this week? Is that six? I think it was six. That's actually a pretty good chunk. That's 20% of the NBA. So you're going to have one or two of those guys on your team just by the math of it. If you have a 13 or 14 player roster and one out of every five roughly has only one game the rest of the week, you got it. Like you can figure it out. You should have about 2.6, 2.8, three of those players on your team. Find one of them or two of them and turn two games into six games. Overwhelm your opponent with games played. That's the head-to-head playoff motto. I'm not sure that my team, you know, I'm, I'm watching one team. My, one of my, I told you guys earlier the week, one of my head-to-head teams got eliminated. That was the one with Steph and Donovan Mitchell and Jimmy Butler, where I got, what, like four combined games out of those, my top three picks. That one's dead. But there's one still hanging on. Uh, with our good, it's actually in a league with a uh, friend of the show, Vince Miracle, and I don't, my, I don't think my team has any business winning. Just from looking at the way things stacked up at the beginning of the week, my first round pick is Tatum. He only had a three game week. My second round pick is Freddie Van Vliet. He only has a three game week. I think Darius Garland was third or fourth round pick in that one. Three game week. All my best players, C.J. McCollum, I think, might have been my third or fourth round pick. He's the one that has four. Everybody else, three-game week. I shouldn't be winning, but I've been so clever with my moves that every time I use one, I'm gaining two games. This is a five-move limit week. So I took a team that was going to have about 39 or 40 games played, and I'm turning it into a team that has like 48 games played. That is an enormous jump. And the thing that I think mentally... So here, here's the thing. Uh, the only reason to make a move on uh, tomorrow, Friday, is if your Saturday is overloaded. Saturday is a relatively large card, not colossal. So eight, I mean, by all accounts, you probably aren't overloaded the rest of this week. Every, every day has between five and eight, I think. Um, so the only reason to make a move on, on Saturday, Friday or Saturday, really, is if you're overloaded. 
Because once you're through today, the most you can get out of your last move is one extra game played. So you might as well just use that on Sunday. I would say save one for Sunday because there's going to be some category that you want to attack at the very end of the week. But most of your moves should be used up today. Thursday. Today's the day. I want to talk about one little thing mentally that I think folks struggle with uh, when it comes to the idea of the long stream. And that is, what if the guy you're picking up has bad games? You know what my answer to that is? It doesn't matter. That's the beauty of the long stream and of piling up so many games played over the course of the week that some bad ones really don't matter all that much. I'll use an example of Kevon Looney, who I picked up for the Warriors five games in seven nights in the league I was just telling you guys about. He's been terrible two of his last three ball games, But you know what? It adds up. When you go five times in seven days, even if you're not very good, look at Looney's last five games. They're not great. <laughs> I would argue kind of bad, actually. Four steals, three blocks total. Here's the thing. If you look at it from an averages standpoint, it looks awful. If you look at it from an averages standpoint, it looks awful. Over his last five games, what is he at here? Nine, 18, 22. He's at like four and a half points per game. I think he's at about seven and a half to eight rebounds. Uh, something like two and change assists, 0.8 steals, 0.6 blocks, 0.6 turnovers. That doesn't look very good. What did I just say? Four and eight, four, eight and two with under a steal and under a block. Oh yeah. Horrendous in a three game week. Pretty useful in a five game week. Now you're talking 20 points. Close to 40 rebounds, over 10 assists, 4 steals, 3 blocks. Compare that to some of the guys in your league, on your team, that only have 3 games over that same stretch. Yeah, they probably beat the 20 points because you only have to average 7, but do you think they beat 40 rebounds? I doubt it. Over 13 rebounds a game? You think they beat 12 assists in 3 games? Maybe. Maybe, but they got to average 4 in that case. Do they get more than three st- or four steals and three blocks in three games? Doubt it. It looks ugly on a night-to-night basis, but you're looking at totals in the long stream method. Totals is why you want five games in seven days. Totals is you want three and four, six and nine, all the things we've been talking about. Overwhelm your opponent with games played On a night-to-night basis, it won't look pretty. But at the end of the stream, at the end of all of these, you look back and you're like, oh, damn. Like, this guy got more than the dudes playing three games. So my move made sense. And, heaven forbid, one of these long streamers you pick up actually has two or three good games blended in. Now you're really cooking. Now you're really cooking. But it won't happen every time. Sometimes you're going to pick up a long stream that just kind of poops the bed. But at least you're going to get three, four, five games out of them in a really tight, little tight stretch. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, that's it. That's it. Wrapping it up here. Tomorrow, we'll set you up for the weekend and the last week of long streaming. I'm assuming next week. You better not go past next week in your head-to-head league. Because I want to talk about Roto the last part of the season anyway. I am Dan Bespris. Thank you in advance for any review you can drop on the show the five star would obviously be nice at Dan Vespers on Twitter or just Google search Dan from Hoopball. Yep, the old name. And uh, my Twitter account will pop up very quickly. Our overlords are at sportsethos.com and the Twitter account is at Ethos Fantasy BK. Also, shout out to our brand new Fantasy MLB Today show that just dropped earlier this week. Joe Orico has put that together. It's going to be a a five-day-a-week show just like this one for baseball. Yep, we're doing it here at The Ethos. Have a great Thursday, everybody. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow morning. So long.
Ferris, we want you to get the most out of your time and end each day feeling good. That's why we pioneered exclusive lawnmower suspension technology, allowing for full speed mowing, even over the roughest terrain. Grow your business by getting more done in less time with Ferris. Ferris, work hard, feel good. Visit Ferris at Advantage Lawn Equipment and McGuire's Distinctive Trucks.